Hello again. Um, for this particular lecture, we will be focusing on the menstrual cycle, and then I will walk you through what's called a cleavage diagram, and you will be needing to know how to label that. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, for the menstrual cycle, the main purpose for the cycle is to prepare the female body for pregnancy. So when we're looking at the entire cycle, it lasts about, on average, and of course it varies from woman to woman, about 28 days is the average. So each phase of the cycle, and I'll list the phases in just a moment, is regulated at spikes or increases or decreases of a very particular or specific hormone. So you will need to know this. There is a multiple choice question on the exam. The three phases of the cycle, we have the flow phase, follicular phase, luteal phase, and I'll go through each one and we'll talk about the hormones. So to kind of help you, you know, I like mnemonic devices. So FL, FOL, so just the first letter or a couple letters of each to help you remember the order. Okay, so the flow phase is the first five days of the cycle. Now as I'm going through this in just a moment, I will have diagrams up, but it might be helpful to maybe print or as you finish taking notes and you re-listen to the lecture, there's a diagram in your book, your online textbook, to maybe go ahead and look at that. And as I describe them, look at the cycles, the peaks, and the hormones. And I will point those out shortly. So the first five days of the cycle is the flow phase. Now the first hormone that's going to be released is called the FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And it is released from the pituitary gland in the brain. So a follicle, made reference to this, is going to be a group of cells that surrounds the egg, and we've already talked about how the eggs are formed in meiosis, and it's gonna help that egg to mature so that it can be fertilized by the sperm. Uh, the other thing that's going to happen with the FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone, is the endometrium, and the endometrium is the lining of the uterus. So as we go through the process of menstruation, that lining will increase or thicken with the anticipation that the developing embryo will be implanted after fertilization. And so for some women, and everyone's different, um, when that lining, it sheds, um, in other words, it, it literally breaks down or is sloughed off and leaves the body. Um, during that process, it's muscle contractions, and that's what's causing the cramping. So there's a very rich blood supply, and that's what causes it to thicken. The second phase is the follicular phase. This begins on day six, and we'll go to day 14. And we have this hormone again, FSH, and a new one, the LH, luteinizing hormone. These two hormones are going to increase. As they're increasing, it's going to cause ovulation. And ovulation is characteristic of the follicle. Remember, that's surrounding the maturing egg. It's going to rupture, and it's going to release the egg. It looks like a balloon being popped. I'll show you a diagram in just a second. And so it's the hormones, another particular area in the brain, the hypothalamus, is going to stimulate the pituitary for the release of those two hormones. There's also an increase in estrogen, and that's causing the lining of the uterus to thicken. Okay, we've seen that earlier, but now we've got another hormone that's going to help in the process. And so it's going to trigger the egg in the ovary to mature. And the final phase is the luteal phase. Uh, would go from day 15 to 28, and this is where the egg can be fertilized at this point in time. So it's viable, it is ready to be fertilized if needed. Now, in the ovary, the, we've talked about the corpus luteum, and that is simply the empty follicle, and it actually turns a yellow color, and you can read about that in your online textbook. But so that's what it's termed after it has released the egg. And this particular structure is going to release estrogen and progesterone. And those two hormones are going to limit the production of the luteinizing hormone. So it causes that endometrium to thicken 
even more, because remember, it could be supporting an embryo in lady, a fetus, which has this rich blood supply, um, which is the link between the mother and the baby. And it does that by increasing the number of blood vessels, and that's why it's so rich in blood. So when the corpus luteum finally breaks down, that structure decomposes, then the uterus lining will begin to shed. So if there's no fertilization, it starts the entire process over again. It's broken down. The egg is simply released out of the body with um, the flow, menstrual cycle, and then uh, the flow phase, and that's when everything is shed out of the body. These are some different diagrams. The one in your book is really good also. I'm just going to point out a couple of things that I had already mentioned. So what I like about this one is how they um, identify the hormones. So you look at the color code. Uh, LH is the blue line, and the follicle-stimulating hormone is the black. So I can see here is my peak. And at that point in time, we're at day 14, and that's where we have our ovulation. So here is the follicle, follicle-stimulating hormone, okay? And the egg is going to rupture or be released. This is the corpus luteum I talked about. So it is turned yellow. And then it's going to release some other hormones. And here's our progesterone. And they label estradiol, estrogen. Okay, it is a, a part of that. So that's going to be elevated when that happens because released from the corpus luteum. You can see how thick when you get toward, you know, day um, even starting at 16 to 28 or 26, how thick. This is the endometrium, okay? So this would be inside the uterus, and this base here would be attached to the uterine wall, okay? Uh, just another diagram. Um, again, they're all a little bit different. What I liked about this one is that it represented or just showed the basal body temperature. So some people that are having problems getting pregnant, they will check their temperature periodically. And so when their temperature begins to increase, so as we see it here, we're in the luteal phase, and we know that that's when the egg can be fertilized. So what they're trying to do is hit when this level of progesterone and estrogen is at its peak. So that is the best time to get pregnant. And down here at the bottom, meniscus is the flow. Okay, and here the pink is showing that the endometrium is thickening inside the uterus. So they're all different diagrams, but they're all saying the same thing. Okay, so there's two possible routes for the egg. If it's been fertilized, we had mentioned that in the fallopian tube is where it's fertilized. Okay, so what the sperm does is it travels up inside the female, through the cervix, through the uterus, up into one side of the fallopian tube. They kind of split off. And where, whichever side the egg is released, then that's where it will encounter and be fertilized. And then eventually the egg will travel down and be implanted into the uterine wall and it will grow. If it is not fertilized for whatever reason, maybe there's no sperm present or some other situation, then the progesterone levels will drop and then both the egg in the endometrium will slough off, which means they will all pass out of the body, and the endometrium will go back down. It won't be as thick. So this is what it looks like. Um, if it is implanted, here's the uterine wall down here. The endometrium is thickening. We had said that there's an increase in blood vessels. So this is if the embryo has implanted. It literally buries itself into the endometrium where it will grow, and then eventually these blood vessels will attach and develop these membranes that will later become the umbilical cord, which is attached to the mother, and that's how it receives its nutrients and eliminates its waste. Okay, so that was the menstrual cycle. Now for cleavage. Um, this you will need to be able to label the diagram. There's a lot of diagrams on this exam, so I would start studying uh, periodically and frequently. Okay, so here's our ovary, and I'm only showing one half. It happens on the both either side. So the corpus luteum we talked about, that's going to be part of ovulation, maturing follicle. Okay, so that actually comes first, then the corpus luteum, and then ovulation. So I'm going to expel the egg, 
into the fallopian tube or the oviduct. Now these little things hanging down are fimbrae and they're kind of waving, okay? There's a current um, and it actually draw, the current draws the egg down and out or to be fertilized in the fallopian tube or implanted into the uterine wall. So we refer to that as an oocyte is an egg. If it does encounter sperm, it will be fertilized and one sperm and only one sperm can enter into through the follicle and reach the egg where the DNA, the 23 chromosomes are located. So we have the sperm cells and then here is a diagram showing the egg and the sperm. Now, just on a diagram, you cannot tell which is which without actually going in, looking at the chromosomes, determine if there's an X and a Y. Um, so even then, you're not real sure. So if you mix these up, if it's a, this is one thing you need to label, I will take, if you mix them up, if you have sperm, then egg, or egg, then sperm. Does not matter, but those are the nuclei. Once they fuse together, remember from a previous lecture that when the egg and the sperm fuse, so now we've got 46 chromosomes, it is now called a zygote, which means to marry. So this is, the egg has been fertilized. Once that zygote has been created, then the cells start dividing. And this is where the term cleavage comes from. So it's going to duplicate. It'll go two cells, develop into four cells, eight cells, and then it will continue until we get to a particular phase of fertilization called the marula. This structure is a ball of 32 cells. You're going to see that in a lab that we're going to do. Then blastula, this structure is the blastocyst, and it's characteristic because it's now a hollow ball, and all those cells have been pushed to the outside. So if you come over here and look inside the uterus, and I'm sorry, this diagram is a little dark, but here's the marula, here's the blastocyst, and then it continues to travel down, and then it implants somewhere in the uterine wall. It could be on the top, it can be a little bit further down. There are complications. If it um, is too far down, then it blocks the opening to the cervix, but usually it's on the sides of the urine wall. And from time of fertilization to the time it's implanted, it's about seven days total. Okay, now I've got a few questions here. Um, you might want to jot these down. You may see them on an exam or in your lab. So, why can men produce sperm until they are about 100, really old, but women can only produce eggs until they're about 45? Well, if you remember back that during the development of sperm and eggs, that the reason men can produce from the time of puberty to when they die is that they have an unlimited supply of sperm because they go through mitosis and meiosis. So they can keep producing as long as they need to. Whereas female inside the womb of their mother, they've already been predispositioned on so many eggs, which is between four and 500 eggs. And about the time about 45, 50, okay? Um, that would be about the time that they start going through menopause. Okay, next question. Why do sperm have so many mitochondria located near the flagella? So the main pieces of the sperm is you have the head, the mid piece with the mitochondria, and the flagella or the tail. The mitochondria is packed with ATP, and that is the energy that makes the flagella move so the sperm can swim. Why are sperm shaped the way they are? This could be on your lab. Well, first of all, you have the head of the sperm. That is key because that has the 23 chromosomes that will eventually be delivered to the egg to make the zygote and eventually the embryo and the fetus. The other key shape is the flagella and that's used for movement. Okay, why is there a higher risk of having a child with Down syndrome for a mother who becomes pregnant at 39, older in life, compared to a woman who becomes pregnant at the age of 21? Well, I always use this every year as an example. If you've ever looked in the refrigerator and you bought eggs and the new eggs, they're fresh, the yolk is bright and yellow, and if you leave eggs in too long, they start to become dark yellow. 
basically the eggs are getting too old and it could be damaged in some way. And what's being damaged are the chromosomes. So the chromosomes are not separating equally. And we'll look at Down syndrome specifically in our next unit to where when the chromosomes separate, they may not separate during meiosis, which means a whole chromosome will go to one side. And if you end up with three chromosomes at a particular location, then you can have birth defects. Whereas it's less likely if you are age 21 in your 20s, then the system seems to work a little bit more efficiently. Okay, how many sperm can fertilize an egg? There's only one that can penetrate the egg. Because if it's delivering the chromosomes, I don't want multiple sperm entering and I would have an abundance of chromosomes. What happens is the egg has enzymes and the tip of the head on the sperm has enzymes. Once the two come together, there's a chemical reaction. Now I'm making this very simplified. I'm not gonna get into the names of the proteins or the enzymes. But what happens the, through the chemical reactions and the enzymes, once the one sperm breaks that membrane, those reactions, then the enzyme causes the cell membrane to kind of collapse or fuse together and it becomes hard. And it's hard and even with other enzymes in the tip of the sperm head, it cannot penetrate. So that's why only one. So it's a preventive method, uh, method so that you can only have the delivery of 23 chromosomes at any particular time. So that wraps up our lecture. So. And this one may be one that you do have questions on. Do look at the diagrams. I think it helps doing the lecture and looking at the di diagrams at the same time. So I will see you in class.